Okay, welcome back to CST 2120, and this is going to be a lecture on forms. So first part of the lecture, I'm going to cover forms and buttons. So you can, use, you know, there's the sort of standard way of submitting forms with the sort of submit uh, HTML element. And I'm also going to cover how you can use buttons to uh, just process the forms locally using JavaScript. Then second part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about form validation, um, which is an extremely important part of uh, extracting... Uh, pulling data from the user and you know, doing stuff with it. Okay, so there's a sort of a uh, bit of a tradition with forms um, which complicates using them in a more modern way, shall I say, yeah? So traditionally information in forms sent to a server. It's always the server that processed the forms and then the server processed the information and sent back a response to the user. So the standard way in which you do, you sort of on your HTML form in the browser, you fill in some stuff on the form, you click submit, then the browser packages up everything inside the form um, and sends it over to the web server. The web server then processes it using a server-side script, maybe interacting with a database, something like that. Um, and then it, once it's finished processing it, it then sends back a response. It'll generate a new page for the user and then send that back. And then that new page will then be displayed in the browser. This is a sort of typical kind of workflow of traditional forms. So this is sort of a little example of a sort of traditional form. And this is the kind of form um, you're going to be using in coursework too. So the first half of next term, uh, we're going to be using PHP. It's going to be more traditional web programming. And, you know, that's useful because there's lots of stuff out there that's like that. Um, but in the for coursework one and coursework three, we're not going to be doing that in, in this way. But just to explain how traditional form work, forms work. You have the HTML elements form, right? And then you have an action. And the action here is the script on the server that will be called to process the data from the form, yeah? So I've just called this, you know, example.com slash process form, whatever. And then we've got two different methods, which I'm going to come to in a little bit, but the methods are post and get. So with post, the browser will package everything up inside the body of the message that's being sent to the server. Um, so, which means that, you know, as a sort of ordinary user, you can't send that form data without using the actual form. Um, whereas with get, um, what the browser does is it sticks all the form data at the end of the URL and then calls the script with that URL. So as a user, you can then manually generate that URL if you really wanted to, to submit the same data to the server and call the same script on the server. <coughs> so we've got an action and a method. Um, and then inside the form tags, we can put some free text if we like. And then we have these input fields of different types, which I'm going to explain. And each input field has a name. So when the data is sent to the server, it's a kind of key value pair. So the name serves as the key for the data. So in this case, the, the browser will send a piece of data with the key first name. And then the value that's sent to the server is whatever's the contents of the form that's been entered by the user. So you've got a key value pair and the key is the name and the value is the value, right? And then you've got a certain button that hasn't got any kind of name or key value stuff. It's just the submit button. And in a traditional form, that's the button here that we click on to actually send the form off to the server. So with forms, uh, the input fields are the key thing, right? That's what we really care about, yeah? So they're, and these are used to receive different types of input from the user. So depending on the type of the input, um, you'll see, the user will see a different thing inside their browsers. So if you've got input type equals text, uh, password, radio, checkbox, submit. I'm going to go through these in detail now, yeah? So I'm not going to bother with getting the details now. So, um, so we've got a text input, for example. This is the one you use the most probably. It's just standard sort of single line text field and you put some stuff in there. So this is a type input of type text, and you, then you can give it a name, which has said the name is associated with um, whatever the, is the key that's associated with whatever value the user enters here. So if the person typed in Buckaroo Banzai, um, the key would be full name and the value would be um, Buckaroo Banzai. And then we've got password. So this is just the same as text, except um, that the characters are obscure, just prevent shoulder surfing, that kind of stuff. A submit um, is just a sort of unique thing within a form, and when you click that, the form will be processed sent to the browser. We've got things like radio input. So in this case, we've got a choice um, between multiple things. So um, in this case, the name of both the radio inputs is the same, because we're only going to make one choice, the exclusive choice, and then it'll have a single value, and then the value will be different depending on what the user selects. Yeah? And this is a radio type. And then we've got checkboxes. So again, we can give it the same name, quite how that gets packaged up into the value, I'm not sure, maybe a sort of comma separated list or something like that, I'm not sure. Um, and that's the checkbox, we can do clicks, you can also do radio, if you 
yeah, maybe not. Uh, don't know if you can make these exclusive or not, but look it up. And you've got text areas, so you can have a certain number of rows and columns for sort of larger amounts of text that the user might want to input. Uh, select. So again, here the name here is this is the characters is the key is this is the key and then the value here will depend on which the user selects. Yeah, so we've got different things the user can select. This is the text that you see, and this is the actual thing that's sent to the server um, when it's actually when the form submitted. With HTML5, um, you've got other input types being released, and as I'll mention later, these can be used to validate the data from the user as well. So we've got like date inputs, ranges, like handy slider things, URLs, emails, colors, numbers, telephones, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so these are pretty handy if you want to provide a more sort of user-friendly way of inputting data. Rather than having them to type the date and they'll probably make some mistakes, um, you can use the date input to get an exact date um, in the right format that you want, in a, in a good format. Now your JavaScript code um, is going to need to access the data in a form. So the old sort of method where you just fill in the form and then submit it and it's the, just the server-side script that deals with it, that's no longer valid even, you know, even if we're using more traditional approaches, yeah? You're going to need JavaScript for form validation of some kind. HTML form validation does some stuff but doesn't do everything. And in context of your coursework, um, both the first and the third pieces of coursework, you're going to need to do client-side form processing as well, yeah? So, you could, so for example, with your uh, browser game, you're going to have to do the registration login all in, term, in terms of the browser. Um, so you're going to have to do client-side form processing. And in your third bit of coursework, you're going to extract the data from the form and validate it using JavaScript. And then you're going to send it off to the server using Ajax, which is a way in which JavaScript can send stuff to the server without reloading the page. Because the whole problem with the old form processing method is that you have to reload the page every time you submit something in a form, which means that with a complicated page that can take some time and you lose your place on the page and it's kind of a mess. Yeah, so that's why I don't like um, this whole traditional method of form processing and it's much better to use JavaScript to process the form locally and then send it to the server or not if you need to. So to get hold of that data, um, we're going to use, we've got all the, lots and lots of different document object method, uh, document object model methods that we can use to access the form elements. So we've kind of covered that in a previous lecture. Um, and the thing to remember when you're using the document object model to access, access stuff inside forms is you, the data is inside the value property of the input element. So I found that confusing when I started with this. I just thought the input element itself would have the value, but it's not the case. The input element um, when, once you've got a reference to the input element, that gives you everything, you know, you can control the styles and all the rest of it. You can do all kinds of stuff with the in input element, but the value property is what has the actual data inside it, yeah? So let's have a nice little simple example of accessing form data. So here we've got a standard form. Um, and do, 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 do. Okay, so something I'm going to come to later, but on submit is a event triggered by the form. So when the user clicks submit, it will call this piece of JavaScript code here, submit form. <coughs> and this code is called. It's using document object model method here, document get element by ID. So I've given the form itself an ID here. So I'm getting element by ID test form. That'll give me a pointer to the form itself. Now inside the form, we've got input fields with different names, right? So what I can do is do the form, in this case, get element by ID test form. That's a reference to the form itself. Then I can do dot my name, which will like give me uh, a reference to the input element that has the name my name. And then if I want the value that's entered in the form, whatever the user's typed in here, then I can do my name dot value. So this is a sort of document object model method of getting hold of it and stuff in a form. I could also have just given the name field, uh, given the input uh, an ID just by itself, which being a bit easier as it happens, but you know, never mind, it's say, it still works, yeah. Um, we can also access in a slightly different way using document object model. So document object model has a sort of separate structure that represents, um, that holds all of the forms that are in a particular page. So document.forms will give us all of the forms in a, in a page. It's like an object, I guess. And then my form is one of those forms. So document forms dot my form, that's the, the form with the name my form, will give me a reference to this form. And then dot my name is the sort of input field inside this form. And then dot value will give me this value at the end here. So that's just a different way of doing the same thing effectively. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there's two different ways of sending form data to the server. So as we get sort of further on with this course, I'll go into more of HTTP and post and get and how they work and look at, look at you know, the actual message structure and all this kind of stuff. But for the moment, um, I'm not going to do that here. But for the moment, just remember that uh, post 
puts the all the form data in the body of the HTTP request message. So all messages that are sent, HTTP messages have a body and then a header. Yeah. So everything. So the post puts everything, all the data, the key value pairs from the form inside the body of the message sent to the server. Whereas get appends the form variables to the end of the URL. So you specify the method here um, when you're doing this kind of traditional form processing. And so here's roughly how it works. Yeah. So let's do get first. So when we do a get, when the browser does a get request with a form, it takes everything out of the form or the input fields, and it appends them at the end of the URL here. This is the URL query string, it's called. Yeah. So you have a question mark, um, and then you have they've got the key and the value for each of the elements in the form. So in this case, there's a form input with f key with the name equals first name, and this is what the user entered here. And then you use an ampersand to separate them, and then you've got the key here, last name, and then the value here, banzai. Yeah. So what the browser does is it generates this URL and then it requests that URL from the server. Yeah? <coughs> and then the server will extract this stuff and then do whatever it does and generate a new page and send that back to the browser. So this is the sort of thing you'd use. So there's, a, there's various constraints on how you should use these things, but in this case, uh, maybe if we're doing a search or something on a web page, then this would be a sensible thing to use get for. Yeah. Now post is different. Post, it puts all the data in the form inside the body of the message that's sent to the server. So it just calls, it sends a message, HTTP message, um, to this URL here, contest slash PHP, with the server with this URL, and then it sends everything inside the body of the message. So with this one, with the get, I could in theory get, generate this uh, URL with my browser and just go to that particular point. If I want to test a post request, I either have to use a form or I have to um, use something like Postman, which will dynamically build post requests for me. Yeah? So they work a little bit differently. And usually you'd use Post for things like yeah, login, registration, that kind of stuff, and Get for when you're doing searches and other things like that. So Post, post uh, URL should never be bookmarked, and Get is the sort of thing you could bookmark if you wanted to come back to a particular page at a particular point later. So this term, um, we're focusing on forms processed entirely client-side using JavaScript. Um, and the easy, it's probably the easiest way to use forms is not to actually use these sort of HTML sort of, you know, tags with the form, form tags, but just use the in, input elements by themselves and uh, an HTML button and then just process the data in JavaScript uh, without a form. So there's a button tag in HTML and so you just, it's just a button, I think, don't even need, don't even need, if you don't even need the type button, a bit old code this, um, and then click me is what you actually see in the button and then you can attach uh, event handlers to it so that when you click on the button it'll call a bit of JavaScript code. So just leave that, so easiest way of using forms in JavaScript, in client-side JavaScript, particularly in coursework 1 and coursework 3, um, leave out the form tag and use a button element combined with input elements. So just show you how this works here. So, so note that we haven't got a form here at all, yeah? we're just using the input elements by themselves, we've got a text input and a password input, and to make my life easier, I've just given each of the input, these inputs an ID, yeah? And instead of the form, <coughs> instead of the input type submit, I've got a button here, and I've got a list handler here, so when I click on submit data, um, then it'll call this function here, submit data. And then, um, to actually process the data, when the user clicks submit data, then I can just use document get element by D, to pull out the uh, the name that the user's entered and the password the user's entered, and then here just as an, just, and remember I have to do dot value get any elements themselves won't isn't isn't useful you need to do dot value so you can get the data, and then what I'm doing here is just logging out that data. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at a demo of that. Okay, so this is my form free input. Yep. So if I just whack in, you know, David, you know, I want it's a password net. So like one two three four, it's a classic. Uh, click login, and then so that when I click here, it's calling that function that's extracting the data from these input fields here, and then just outputting them here so I can see them. Yeah, so very simple, you know, use of forms and showing how you can access the data from them. Okay, so in your first piece of coursework, you have to develop a game. Yeah, and at least in the current marking scheme, this may change next year. I'm not necessarily going to record this lecture um, twice, you know, just to change the marking scheme, but the marking scheme will stay roughly consistent. So you, you can assume that there'll be, there's a small number of marks and currently five out of 15 uh, for producing a basic game, yeah? 
So your basic game could be, and I'm totally fine with that, a simple quiz of some kind, yeah? So I'm going to show you now an example of a simple quiz with a single question, okay? Now you're not going to get full marks uh, for a full 5 out of 5 um, for a basic game for just having a quiz with one question, yeah? So your basic game, uh, if it's a quiz, that's totally fine. You can do a basic game quiz, I'll give you 5 marks, but only if you have like several questions and, you know, when the user answers one question then they then it presents the next question and keeps a continuous score. A simple quiz with one question is not enough to get the full marks, full five marks, sorry, um, for the basic game. Obviously, the more complicated game, you're not going to get, f you know, 15, 15 out of 15 uh, for a, uh, you know, for a, for a simple quiz with five questions, yeah? This is, I'm only talking here about the basic game marks, not for the advanced game marks, yeah? So for the basic game, I'm giving you this simple quiz example, and you're welcome to use and adapt this code. Um, but as I said, you're going to have to add some extra questions to it and obviously integrate it with the rest of your website. So this is a very ba very sort of simple math quiz, right? We're going to ask what is 2 plus 2, they're going to submit the answer, and uh, if they get the answer correct, we've got the feedback to the user here, answer correct, or if they get it wrong, we're just going to say answer incorrect, yeah? So let's just do a demo of what this looks like. So what is 2 plus 2? Well, let's, you know, let's guess 6, for example. And answer is incorrect, and then, you know, after a bit of cheating with my calculator, let's say, um, I submit uh, four, and I find out that, you know, the answer is correct, yeah? So, it's not not well beating a game website, but, you know, it gives you, I mean, it's really just illustrating the ideas here, yeah? So, how does this work, yeah? So, at the beginning, we've got this question. So, as I said, um, if you want to get f five out of five for a basic game, you're going to have to you know, basically give this uh, paragraph thing an ID of some kind and then have an array of questions and then insert the questions um, sequentially as the user answers them, yeah? And keep track of the score. But in this case, it's just a single question quiz, so we've just got a sort of static piece of HTML there, just a paragraph, yeah? Then we've got our input, uh, form-free input, right? We've just got input field and then a button. Again, remember it's a button, not a submit input type. Um, so we've got, it's got a button, and when we click on that button, it's going to call um, this function here, submit answer, because I put a set up an event handler here. Um, and then very easy this, so user answer, I'm getting out the, um, getting a reference to this input field here, which has the ID response. And again, I need, don't forget dot value at the end of that. <clears throat> and then I check to see if it's a correct answer, so the correct answer is up here, correct answer is four, so if that equals that, and I'm not doing strict uh, type checking with JavaScript because this is almost this is probably going to be a string, and then this is a number here. Yeah, so I'm doing sort of sloppy sloppy type comparisons here. And then um, at the bottom here, then I give feedback to the user: have they got it right? Have they got it wrong? So in this case, it's answer correct. So I'm just changing. I'm dynamically inserting some HTML in here in the feedback area, um, saying that the answer is correct and styling it black um, because it's correct um, and then I'll style it red if, they, if they've got it wrong yeah so obviously these two bits of code here will be different you know in your in a in a quiz of multiple questions you know you'd but you'd um, you'd be then loading up the next question and keeping track of the score in this in this particular part and checking to see if the game's over or not yeah so if you like if you ask me in the Q&A session I'm happy to explain how you can make this work with multiple questions yeah okay so that's just a little suggestion if you're really stuck and you're really struggling with javascript then you can build a simple quiz starting with that code yeah but not finishing with that code because you're going to add multiple questions <coughs> so now uh, i think i've explained pretty much how you can extract data from get data from the user um, and now i'm going to show you how you can validate this data now form validation is extremely important and there's sort of two two sort of two reasons why it's so important in, in web development so the first reason is um you want to make sure that the client or the user has given you the correct data, yeah? Because, for example, if they made a, on <coughs> an order for a product online um, and they've given you, like, a meaningless address, then you're then going to have to mess around and contact them or maybe the, the email address is wrong, then you won't be able to contact them and maybe you've taken the credit card money and you won't be able to, you can't refund it because you haven't got the email address or phone number or something like that. So you've, whatever you're doing, dealing with customers, you need to make very sure what they've entered is correct and meaningful and valid, yeah? So form validation plays a very important role in that, yeah? The other reason form validation is important is that, you know, when, you're, when your website's deployed with a public URL, um, pretty much everyone, anywhere in the world is going to try and hack it at some point, yeah? There's, you know, hor horrifying statistics about how many, you know, probing attacks are launched at websites every second, yeah? 
And one kind of attack um, that people can launch, I mean there's many, but one, one kind is what's called an SQL injection attack. And there's also no SQL injection attacks, but with an SQL injection attack, suppose you, so SQLs are a language that you can use to interact with your database. And what people do is they insert into a form SQL statements, and then if you don't check those statements correctly, they can be executed on your database, which can give the attacker control over the database, they can sort of view users, they can delete all, the, all your data and so on and so forth, which is stuff you really, really don't want to happen, yeah? So you need to check the data client side um, to make sure that the user's data is correct from the business point of view. But you also need to check the data server side to make sure someone's not trying to hack your database. Because someone who's trying to hack your database, they're not going to just enter stuff in the form on the web page. I mean, they might, but you know, then they'd have to deal with the JavaScript validation and other kinds of validation. What they can also do is just use Postman or a similar tool to send an HTTP request with the form data directly to the server. And if they do that, you get, they're going to bypass all of the client-side validation. So you also need to check the data server-side to make sure that it's valid, yeah? So you don't need to do the customer checks server-side because it's too late, but you can do the stuff, um, you can do the prevention of attack type checks um, server-side. So customer-side, you need to make sure that data is totally correct and, make sh and don't let the customer pay for anything until it is correct. Server-side, we're checking to protect ourselves against hackers, yeah? So because of the importance of this, I've included some marks of form validation in coursework one, yeah? <coughs> so, um, different ways of doing form validation. Well, two, mains, two main ways, yeah? So one is to use HTML5 form validation. I'll explain how that works. But you're also probably going to need some JavaScript to check um, that user input's present correct before sending it to server, because HTML5 form validation is useful, although actually quite annoying, as I'll explain. Um, but... Um, so, and, and it doesn't check everything, like validity of pass, strength of password, for example. And as I said, you need to also check server-side, I'm not covering that in this lecture, but server-side, you should also check that user input data is correct. So if you want something to be, the, you want to make sure that the user always enters a particular field, yeah, you can use the, add the required element attribute to the input elements, yeah? So if we have, here we've got um, an input type text and it's required, and that means if I try and submit some, an empty field, um, then it won't be submitted. Yeah, obviously not everything's going to be required. Sometimes, you know, the county is not relevant if you live in London, for example. But often this is something you want to specify things that are required by the customer, yeah? And the HTML5 input types can also be used to check um, that users have entered data in the correct format. So they can make sure that it's an email address, a URL, a date, and so on and so, so forth, yeah? So if you're using these HTML5 input types and you specify required, you can make sure both... These input types are helpful in two ways. Yeah, firstly they're helpful because they can, because of the graphical inter, because of the nature of the, the widget, whatever you want to call it, they constrain the user to enter the data in a certain way. So instead of just getting them to type a date, and they might get confused between American and British dating systems, for example, we can use a sort of widget to push to show them a sort of calendar so they can pick the date, and then we're going to get the date in the exact format that we're expecting, rather than one that the user kind of made up. You know, did they include the year? Did they not the full year and all this kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, and the same with email, you know, it'll, it'll validate the email to some extent to make sure it is a valid email address, yeah? And same true of numbers, telephone numbers, URL. So this will really help in terms of constraining what the user can enter, yeah? And it'll also run some rudimentary checks. So if I just type dog and click submit, it'll say, need to include an at in the email, it's missing an at. These may not be perfect, yeah, but they're, but they're all right, yeah? So uh, this, this is okay, but there are some problems, yeah? The problem is um, that HTML5 form, form validation only works when the input elements are inside a form, yeah? And guess what happens when you click submit on a form? The, what, the, what the browser does, it tries to send that form to the server. Um, so you either have to prevent the form from being submitted um, somehow, and I'll explain how you can do it, um, or you have to do some sort of clever stuff um, if you want to do client-side client -side form pr processing, yeah? Um, so, for example, we don't want to use the standard form submission method in Coursework 1, where we're not using a server at all, so it's completely pointless to try and send it to a server. Or Coursework 3, what you want to do with your form is process it locally using JavaScript, and then use JavaScript to set, we'll use Ajax, which is a way in which JavaScript can talk to the server without reloading the page. Because, you know, with the big pages, old, old style form methods, handling methods are just really annoying, right, because you submit something and then the entire page reloads and maybe you lose your place on that page and all that. Yeah, so. For both Coursework 1 and Coursework 3, we don't want to use standard traditional form submission methods. 
Um, and even coursework two, there's real, no real need for it, and it's probably worse if you do use the standard method, yeah? So generally, if you're trying to use HTML5 form validation, you have to prevent the form from submitted. Um, and the way to do that is there's an attribute called onSubmit, which is the event handler. And onSubmit will, is what's used to call JavaScript code. And if we just return false, that will block the form from being submitted. So that's, that's what we have to do. So I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail, but as a sort of rough first answer, if we set onSubmit to return false, um, this is like, if we usually we do return and then call some JavaScript function to check the form, and if that returned false, then we'd, um, that would tell us that, um, that there was something wrong with the form. So that's why this mechanism exists, yeah? So if you set that like that, then when you click submit, the form will just stay there and won't do anything, yeah? And that's kind of what you want for, for, uh, for your, for mo probably for most of your coursework. So just to show you, yeah? So, so firstly, let's just go to this form validation. So here, this is what I've seen many, many, many times um, in the time I've been teaching this course, yeah? You've got a form here, and someone's kind of copied or used an old tutorial or something, um, and in the old style of form processing, you'd have an action and a method, yeah? So specified in the form, and when you click submit here, the, the browser would send the stuff in the form to that script there, usually you have a deep, if that's less than a local script, I guess, using post or get, yeah? So what you get if you copy this code off a tutorial somewhere and try it in your coursework one, for example, you know, you get, you know, it's not quite disaster, but it's pretty annoying, yeah? So let me just show you the email validation first. So these are both required fields, I think. So if I click submit, it says, please fill in this field. If I type the alert, uh, it tells me that the field's wrong and then I need to do the alert. Uh, does that get it right? Yeah, actually, so it's not actually really a valid email at all. Yeah, but never mind, yeah. Um, so, and then with password, it's like one, two, yeah. So if I'm using traditional methods and I just copy that code without understanding what's going on and I click submit, it's gonna try and send that stuff to this do something script here, yeah? So you're just gonna get an error. Pretty annoying, yeah? So to fix that error, um, what we could then do is just delete this stuff because that shouldn't be there anyway because we're not trying to submit it to some random script that doesn't exist. So do that and save that and go back. I think I might need to refresh it. Okay, so let's do the same thing here. Let's get it valid this time, yeah? So one, two. And then we click submit this time, and what happens is um, it will sort of submit it to itself in a way, yeah? So it'll, it'll, it won't submit it anywhere, but it'll completely refresh the page. So that prevents, so if, I'm, if it's got that approach, what, I, what I've often seen is that the error, if there's an error in the form, for example, it'll kind of, with the JavaScript, it'll kind of flash up here very briefly if they're inserting the error into the page in the way that I've shown you many examples, and then it'll disappear immediately because the page is being reloaded, yeah? So if, you, if you'd use this approach, just, what I've just shown you here, with just the form here like that, and you click submit and all that, it's going to refresh the page and often it destroys any error messages that users, that the programmer or whatever's put in, yeah? So this kind of sucks too, yeah? You could avoid that um, if you dropped a cookie or drop, put something in local storage so that when the page loaded it knew that it had been submitted, but it's all, it's all a mess, yeah? And you really don't want that, yeah? So to, to fix that, yeah, what we do is on submit, that's, the, that's an event trigger when the form's submitted, and then we have to do this return false business, yeah? We can't just do false, it has to be return false, yeah? And we can get away with that semicolon, I think, so let's just check that. Okay, so now we got, uh, let's refresh just in case, pretty sure it's okay. So again, now we do the same thing here, we enter the stuff here, and in this case, we click submit, and it doesn't submit the form. So that's what we want to do if we want to use the validation, but we've still got the validation in here, we've still got the HTML validation, right? If we just do that, um, it's going to check that the form's okay before submitting it. So we've got the validation, but when we get it right, um, then it doesn't submit the form and we're okay, yeah? So, yeah, hopefully that you know, explains that. <coughs> now, you're also, the HTML5 validation is okay, but you're probably also going to need some JavaScript code that checks that form as well, yeah? Um, and this is what I explained. So you have this on submit event, and if you link that to a JavaScript function, and then you return false, if, the, if everything's gone, if something's wrong with the form, or you return true, and then the form will actually be submitted, yeah? So, just I can actually show you that in the code I just showed you. So in this case, it returns false. If you return true, um, then I think it's probably return, refresh, yeah? So in this case, it's returning true, so we're getting the same behavior of it, submitting the form where we don't really want that, yeah? Um, okay. So here's a little example, yeah, of how JavaScript form validation, and really, 
you're going to want to be able to call in JavaScript when you click Submit if you're using traditional forms, not only for validation, but also to do things like load the next question if you're doing a quiz or, um, you know, uh, store the data in local storage if you're doing coursework one, yeah? So, as I said, I really recommend you don't use form tags, yeah? But if you're going to use form tags, this is kind of stuff you have to do, yeah? Um, so, if we have form, so you've got a form, and again, here on Submit, instead of pointing to return false, I'm returning whatever is returned from this function here, yeah? So it's going to call check password in this case. This check password returns true or returns false. If it returns false, this is going to return what's returned here, in this case false, and it won't submit the form. On the other hand, if it gets to here and returns true, it's going to return true, and then the form will be submitted, yeah? So this is... Uh, so HTML5 is not going to check your path, password strength, I don't think. You know, it doesn't, in fact. Um, so what I'm using here is what's called a regular expression. Now, regular expressions are, you know, they can mess with your mind a bit, but they're a, a, a sort of a way of representing a set of rules um, that are, can be applied to a string, basically, yeah? So this is a set of rules, and if we apply those rules to a string and the string conforms to those rules, then the regular expression kind of matches that string, or the string matches that regular expression, and we get like a true when we do this testing business here. This is what I'm doing here. If the rules don't, if the string doesn't match those rules, then the regular expression will turn false. So it's a way of, in this case, these rules are specifying that um, the password must have a lowercase a letter character, an uppercase character, um, and a number, and must be at least six long. Yeah. So you'll see lots of different regular expressions over the internet. I don't mind if you copy the regular expression itself off the internet. I'm not expecting you to write those from scratch and become an expert in regular expressions. They can be quite tricky. It's totally fine to copy regular expressions, but obviously not fine to copy, you know, the, the entire code for validation or something like that, yeah? So this kind of chunks of regex is, I'm fine with you copying, yeah? Right, so, because people do that all the time. I just copied that and I just adapted this off some website, yeah? Okay, so, so what we got, just to re recap, so we're calling check password. We've got a regular expression, we're going to use the checked password, and then this is the stuff here. So when we click submit, it's going to call this function here. We're going to get the password out of the input field in the way I've covered many times now. And then we have this password regex, that's this thing here, because it's an actual regexpress object, it has a test method, and that test method will return true if, pass if the password string conforms to these rules, and it will return false if the password string doesn't conform to these rules. So in this case, I'm seeing if it doesn't conform to these rules, so if it's not true, in this case, if it's false, so not false is true, right? Then it's going to do this stuff here. So it's going to say that this password is not secure and return false. Otherwise, it's going to return true. So in traditional form processing, this thing's used to do additional checks to the form um, before it's submitted. And when it returns true, then it's going to submit. As I said, in your coursework, one and three, you're almost certainly going to always want to return false to prevent the form from being submitted. So let's do a little demo here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay. So here's my login form. So again, I'm not going to bother with the, showing the validation again. That's there, yeah. But then if we do like one, two or something like that, yeah, and submit it, it's going to tell me it's not secure. And then if I do, you know, a lower character, upper character, and a number, it's still not secure because it's not got the right length. And if I add like three Ws or something, then it's going to submit it to the to the server, yeah. And again, this does this annoying refresh business. I could stop that annoying refresh business if I um, if I returned. Uh, false here instead of true. Okay, so in course of one, um, there's marks for the validation of input data from forms. Um, now, I'm a, in the current marking scheme, I said this may change without, yeah, in future years, but um, there's some marks available for HTML5 validation. So you can use it if you like, but you don't have to use it at all, and I probably recommend you don't use it because the messy stuff with submitting forms and all that kind of stuff, yeah? You can only get full marks for validation if you use JavaScript to validate some or all of the data, yeah? So what the nice validation scheme would be, you know, using JavaScript to check the input and then highlighting empty fields, you know, using red or, you know, little, un little error messages for each of the things that the user's got wrong and explaining why, yeah? That's what modern professional websites do. They don't just use HTML5 validation because that's sort of, it's crude and it's got this whole messy stuff with forms, yeah? So if you want to get full marks for validation, just do it all in JavaScript, yeah? You can get half marks if you do just, just HTML5 validation. So, um, you know, this book, you know, I haven't really talked about these headfirst books much. I do like them, but uh, a lot of them are a bit out of date. But this kind of gives you a decent amount of background on how forms work in HTML, yeah? HTML forms work. Okay, 
So in this lecture, I've explained how you can add forms to your web pages and process the data in them. Um, and I've sort of stressed the importance of validation in the second part, um, because you, from a business point of view, you need to make sure that your customers are entering the right data, so you can contact your customers, send the products to the right address, and all that kind of stuff. And it's extremely important to check the, check the input data server side um, to, to prevent yourself from being hacked, which is obviously bad, yeah? Okay.